Cheers, Mateusz Stasica, PLA School, and this is Polishing English in Business with Balls. Today I'm having a conversation with Lech Guzowski, but I have had a major fuck up with my microphone, so I haven't recorded my questions. I, I had to re record the whole thing from my perspective. So, this is the outcome. Welcome. What the way are we talking about? HR strategy, HR development, because they have to evolve and they need to grow a pair of balls. Let's listen. Hi Lech, tell us something about yourself and why. Is it worth listening to you at all? Oh wow, that's that that is a big opening question. Um it puts me in a spotlight. Let me let me have a think. Uh, first of all, Lech Kuzowski, Mateusz, thank you very much for having me. Very nice to uh, to be talking to you today. In terms of what I do is I uh, I'm a, I'm a strategic and uh, strategic advisor and a culture designer uh, as well within organizations. So what that means, I help organizations align their strategic priorities. What what direction they're heading in, what they're doing as a business, and aligning that with the ways that they need to work within within the organization, inside the organizations, how they, they how their team dynamics uh, work, and making sure that those two pieces are pointing in the same direction, that there's uh, there's there's alignment between that, uh, so that the uh, the organization can achieve its uh, potential, and the people within the organization can achieve uh, their their potential as well realize their potential of what what they can do and with that alignment i don't want to say things within the organization are easy easy to achieve but they're easier to achieve that's that's for sure um the reason why you should listen uh why would it be valuable for you for you i'm coming off the back of experience in uh, as a project manager for for many years i lived in the uk for over 13 years and i worked with a lot of organizations within uh within the uk but also uh europe as and us uh, as well and hr is something that is of course a big part of it so i never i've never worked in hr as such but I've worked with HR over the past five or five or six years because the work that I do usually lands uh, between I'm usually the linchpin between HR and business operations. So if you if you imagine the CEO, COO, and then HR departments, because usually there's a gap between these two, quite a big one. And I tend to be the the, the linchpin, the bridge between them to kind of bring them together uh, again, which is something that every business needs to have but yet still that for some reason that gap is uh that gap is there and i help close it cool <laughs> so you think there is quite a lot to do in this area right yeah there there, there is there is a, a lot of pressure on hr and uh, over over the past few years uh, you you were my guest on on my podcast uh, a while back and i still say and probably will for a long long time uh, say that you've given me the best sound bite that i can i can imagine uh, by simply saying uh, that hr needs to grow a pair of balls and i i do agree with that it's 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 shocking and controversial to many but i think it's one of those phrases that just catches attention and hopefully gets people to think because i know you did not mean it in a in a mean and an abusive way it's just something that genuinely kind of people need, need to grasp that there, there's a gap hr is vital in every organization but their role needs to evolve uh, quite quickly to be something that genuinely understands and supports the business but it's not all hr's fault um actually whose fault it is is kind of a situation of what was first chicken or the egg so there's no point in focusing on on that um it's simply about hr uh, communicating with the business better and the business communicating with HR and they, them helping uh, each other. So HR helping the business understand more the people element the, from, a, from a tangible, practical, hands-on point of view. Uh, tangible is the most important one. Um, and the business helping HR understand strategy, strategic priorities and, and them working together on that. So it's that co-education of one another, I guess, that is really important. Culture designer. Have you forged it yourself or what? You know, you know what? I, th I think to a certain extent, I coined it myself many, many, many years ago. But I think I can't say that I'm an inventor of it. I must have seen it somewhere. I came across it just uh, because the, you know, the, the, the phrase culture design is 
is a thing. And there's many companies who do culture design. Therefore, if I do culture design, I'm a culture designer. So it's just kind of a natural um, uh, progression uh, from, from from that. And I don't like uh, for myself fancy titles like, you know, CEO and things like that, simply because I run a, a small organization. It's an organization of me and my multiple multiple personalities um so it's it's basically uh, it's difficult to call myself a ceo in that in that sense and it's also i think not appropriate uh because it's just kind of trying to be a little bit, bit too big for your breeches. I don't know. It's kind of the, that, that kind of feeling that I get. So I don't think it was relevant. So for me, it's just I'm, I'm an owner of my of my agency, organization, business, however you want to call that. Uh, and uh, my title my title represents what it is that I help my clients do. Multiple personalities. How many are there? Oh, I lost count. <laughs> Uh, no, jo- 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 jokes, jokes aside, it's uh, I don't know whether you've seen the movie Split um, uh, with James McAvoy. Uh, it's one of the three uh, of the director whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce because I'm going to absolutely butcher it. He's a believe of uh, Indian origin, of uh, Indian descent, Sham- Shamalayama, Shamalayaman. I butchered that, um, but Split, great movie. Talking about Split personalities, uh, he's got many. Uh, his, his, his are all. Oh, some of them are funny, some are brutal. But I do often laugh that uh, when you're a business owner, it's not necessarily about uh, split personalities, but it's the multiple things that I have to do because I uh, I work with clients, I facilitate, I design, I, I strategize, I facilitate workshops, I run workshops, uh, I do the marketing, I do the admin. Uh, I do the sales, I do content creation. Therefore, those are the multiple personalities that that I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, there's quite there's quite a few of them. There's quite a few for sure. <laughs> and it probably helps catching this perspective, right, of of different roles like managers, CEOs, and stuff like this, or not. I I think the, the this is just the nat- nature of running a, a a business on your own or having you know a small organization. You you have to do multiple things. That's just natural. Uh, I wouldn't even say co- consequence. I say just that's 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 natural natural char- characteristic of running a small business. So I, I I often speak and I often work with small startups that have ten people, and it's the same situation. The same one person does multiple things. Um, to answer what you what you're asking about, what really helps me uh, from the way I am as a as a person, my personality and my one of my greatest strengths is the fact that I'm a generalist. So I can. Mm, I, I have interest and I'm uh, knowledge and experience in in various aspects, various um, industries, ver- various kind of topics and domains, uh, and f- and I worked in in multiple jobs in multiple industry in multiple functions, and that's what really helps me. I draw uh, my knowledge from my from my knowledge from my experience. And I can utilize that to help my clients. So that's my, my, my greatest ability, my greatest strength is that I have this very vast pool of experience and knowledge that I can look into and say, actually, you know, I'm working with a client uh, in an in, in automotive industry, but I've worked in pharmaceuticals, I worked in IT, I worked in hospitality, I've worked with various clients from va- various other industries. And the brain, the way my brain works is it makes connections between seemingly unconnected things and i can say to my automotive client uh give them an idea something that's connected marketing project management and um it from those those days and i can give them an idea on on that something that's going to benefit their automotive thing so that's my greatest strength that that ability to as steve jobs said connect the dots um not necessarily looking backwards but things that seemingly unconnected i can say how about you do this very often, it's a stupid idea, and so and somebody tells me, no, it's not going to work. But very often, I also get, actually, that's brilliant. We never thought of that. And they couldn't have thought of that because they are in th- their their realm. Uh, and that's normal. And I'm not because I'm in different places, and I've got knowledge in different in different um, areas. I can, I can make that connection, and I can give it to somebody, and they can say, yeah, actually, that's a brilliant idea. We would have never thought of that. This is how you actually recreate 
negative experience into into something positive and to something right because at PLA school we really often repeat that mistakes can be good for you if you play it right right like this little child she or he or her uh, he or she is you know like riding the bike and falling down and scratching their knees and oh that's blood upia let's go for it once again right this is this is the attitude uh, the the one, the one thing i would say i wouldn't i wouldn't call it a negative experience i would say it might be semantics but i find it very very important uh, that it's not a negative experience it's something that gave me value it was it was a, it was a difficult experience for sure that i've learned from and i had i had multiple ones in in both in personal and professional life in the in professional life actually something that was a very difficult experience at the time but I would be in a different place to where i am now I, i'm certain i don't know whether it would be a better and a and a and a, or, or a worse place it's it's that's arbitrary that's that's very difficult to say um was that actually i was let go from a job uh, as my as a project manager that was my last uh, employee job and that was four years ago uh literally from one day to the next uh, it was announced that me and half my team were told not to come into work the next day and that was um due to restructuring within the organization they just decided that they're going to be moving uh, certain operations to a different part of the business and they no longer needed our services and that was it and you know what it was tough it was really really tough the first time in my life i was let go from a job uh through no fault of my own mm, uh, apart from the fact that uh, obviously you you fear for your finances because that's kind of the main thing that, that that's what's put in jeopardy i've never felt freer in my life for the first two weeks for the first time in my life i've re and i i i'll never forget that feeling and i've never been even though i manage my time entirely myself and i've got full autonomy of my time i haven't been been able to regain that time and what i'm talking about is for the first two weeks i've regained 40 hours per week because i didn't have to go to work i didn't have to go to the office and it's not the same as taking time off it's all of a sudden you don't have to go to work and deal with certain things sometimes pretend that you're busy when you're not busy which i know that a lot of people do there's a concept of doing a second job of hiding who you are um at work pretending to be somebody who you're not and i've realized that i must have been doing that for a, a part of my job as well because i've genuinely i've had the mental and creative freedom that i got as a result and the energy and the capacity that i've regained was astounding and that's the first and only time in my life that i felt that way as i say it's not the same as just taking two weeks holiday it's not the same it's something it's something all of a sudden that you kind of something's lifted it's as if you are carrying a very heavy weight for a number of years and all of a sudden somebody lifts lifts that and for the first two weeks you kind of go oh my god i'm so i feel so light i can i can nearly fly right that type, that type of attitude and it was i i had that on an emotional and and psychological level that i had that freedoms that oh i don't need to go to work i don't have that pressure of dealing with certain things within within the team within the organization within, within the challenges right um that i can all of a sudden i have freedom to decide what the hell i want to do it's scary because i don't know when my next check paycheck is coming in but that freedom for the first two weeks was brilliant and the funny thing is i've spoken to a few people since then that have been in a similar uh, situation where they've been surprisingly let go from their job and i told them this story hand on heart every single person i've told this to they came back after a while and said you were fucking right it is exactly like that that they regained that they had that it's scary like hell but they they had that same i don't want to say it was epiphany but that kind of sense of freedom all of a sudden and that lightness on a mental and emotional level Oh yeah, been there, done that. There you go. Um, and I have also emigrated to the UK. So, why did you? <laughs> it was a classic example of uh, finishing one university degree, which I did in in Poland, and being twenty or twenty twenty two when you finish your first um, uh, when you first when you finish your bachelor's degree. It was a classic example of what the hell do I want to do with my life? I don't know. It's scary. I know. I'll do another degree. 
that's going to save me from adult life for three years. I won't have to make that decision. And that was a classic example. Uh, I wanted to live abroad. I didn't know what to do with my life in the, in the sense of uh, work. Uh, I had a path of sorts uh, because the first d- degree was in English studies um, because I was, I was thinking of being a, a translator or interpreter. Um, but uh, about halfway through the, the degree, I decided that that's not what I want to do. Uh, so I decided to to go to university to do another bachelor's degree, but do that in the in the UK. So I moved to to uh, the Midlands, the the central part of the UK. I first I went to the University of uh, Wolverhampton, and I lived in Wolverhampton, and I lived in Birmingham for 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 a number of years. Mm, so I, I was there for three years at university, just as a normal student, uh, and I studied event management and tourism, which really connects with. Uh, kind of my, my my personality and then led me to being a, a project manager and an event manager in a certain way because it was a big part of my role and after I graduated for, after three years then obviously I, I, I stayed um, stayed around for another 10 years so that was 2004 I don't remember now but yeah it was a long time ago but all in, in total I lived in the UK for 13 years yeah and why did you leave then for me personally the weather very and the much, atmosphere so, yeah. and the vibe, I couldn't stand it. So mm, I wanted to leave the UK for quite a while, move to to another another country. Uh, so Poland wasn't really on the cards. Uh, for a long time, I was absolutely in love with Stockholm and wanted to move there. I even had a job offer, uh, but decided not to take it for for, for personal relationship and and relationship reasons when I was still in the UK. Mm, and that was a few years before eventually I decided to decided to leave uh, and leaving the UK was was a decision that I will actually wasn't that I'm going to go come back to Poland it, the idea was that I'll come back to Poland I'll regroup uh, myself and sort things out and then do a bit of slow travel around the world but never happened <laughs> exactly exactly yeah um, uh, but the, the slow travel idea was uh, was was the main one that I'll just being a digital nomad and moving from one place to another every two days, that's not for me. I like to go to a place. I want to stay there for a month, enjoy it, live there, and then potentially maybe move somewhere else. And that was that was the idea uh, to, to to do to do that travel for you know for for, for a while, go for, to a place for two or three months, then go somewhere else, then go somewhere else. Um, but uh, I came to Poland. I actually started enjoying myself. I never lived in Gdańsk, where I'm where I'm based. Uh, I'm I've been here before. I'm not I'm I'm not I'm I'm from not too far away from here but uh, i've never actually lived there and i didn't know what that's what the city is like and i absolutely, absolutely love this place it genuinely has everything that i need uh, and uh, i really enjoy being here so i decided to change the model uh, that i kind of do the slow travel but from here that if I, I live here most of the time this is my base this is my route this is my central hub from which i can fly out for a month or two months or wherever um uh, where, whenever and whenever i want so for the past few years i've been going to italy to live there for for, for a month and a bit uh, and and enjoy that that time there and and doing that so that's kind of be- better the model uh what what helped me is that i got uh, a british passport so I'm, I'm a dual citizenship i'm a british citizen now which means i can go back at any point brexit brexit doesn't affect me in any way i don't need a visa i just pull out my british passport and i'm 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 i'm, I'm british so i'll I'm, that's my second home in a way so i can go back there at any point if i wanted to which is which is which is helpful considering uh, everything that's going on, obviously, and having that option there, uh, m- and being able to go back at any point in a very easy way uh, made that decision of leaving even easier as well. All right, you're right. Let's move back to psychology and sixteen <laughs> personalities. The test. What do you think of it? And uh, well, did you have it yourself? Yeah, I've done, I've done it a while back. I don't remember. I was e, e, ENTJ, I think. I don't remember what it is. But the funny thing is, the first, the f- very first time I ever did it, uh, uh, we were doing it as part of work, and my uh, my, my colleague, where a friend, did was leading, was facilitating the the session, and we laughed because the, uh, the you can either be E or I uh, at the because the first letter, which is extrovert or introvert. And uh, on the scale, I think it was, I think it's 100. Uh, I scored perfectly 50-50. Perfectly 50-50. 
uh, which we laughed because it's actually very representative of personality. I'm, I'm a lot of times I'm an extrovert, a lot of times I'm an introvert, depending on the circumstances. Which is actually what often people what, what is the case because people think that you're one or the other. No, it's the, in a way that it's the context and the background and the situation, the circumstances that dictate which part uh, comes out. Uh, so it's actually a fluid concept. You are in certain aspects of your life, you're an extrovert and ask the others um, an introvert. What can be uh, the case is that one is more dominant than the other, that one, you're more of an introvert in more of the situations than you are an extrovert. But it's not that you're only one. That's not true. And that's one of the biggest misconce misconceptions around it. I love MBTI as a starting point and i actually often recommend it and uh, suggest it to people to do it if they've never done anything like that before uh, as a starting point to do some self-reflection self uh, improvement work fantastic fantastic point to start because it gives you a, as, 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 I said, as i said a point to start uh, if you've never done something like that before uh, that being said is it's a little bit basic it's it's predefined so you will fit into one of those so the it might not necessarily be a true representation uh, of that because it's too short and it's too rigid. Uh, so there are better tests out there, uh, more more comprehensive uh, that really catch elements of who you are as a personality, as a person, where your characteristics are that are more tuned and, as I say, more more personalized through the questions to give you a better, more accurate result. Uh, but that's kind of further down the line. If you've never done it, MBTI do it enjoy it have fun and uh it's a great place to to begin okay and those tests are they a tool in your work o occasionally i will i will suggest that that, that people do them uh, just so we can have a, a, a more informed discussion so they because the, in the work that i do i tend to work with groups uh, i used to do a bit of coaching but now i i, I rarely do it especially at kind of team level i more work with if anything more with business owners and and, and, and ceos uh, on their kind of mindsets and narratives and things uh, that they'll deal with, they deal with to, to help them overcome challenges. Um, occasionally, I'll bring in a test like that as well, just so we that so that we can talk about the person's reactions and um, to certain situations and kind of their attitude in certain situations, how they behave, their, their behaviors, how do they react to certain situations, and that just gives us. Um, a point to start that I'll ask them to do that that test and then we'll just discuss I already have an, an idea of who they are as a person what triggers them what they might be like in certain certain circumstances uh, but they need to also realize that as well so that's why I would sometimes give them a test like that to do so then we can talk about it and you know I had the first question that I always ask is like okay do you agree with what came up uh, with the, the description, the characteristics of the personality. And some, some people say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's so me. It's so accurate. It's fantastic. I could never put that into words. Now I know. Thank you for me giving me that. Others would go like, nah, this is BS. I uh, completely know, which, you know, sometimes is, it is true, but sometimes more often than not is actually a defense mechanism. They, they disagree with it because it's actually so true. So there is real value behind those tests and you recommend doing them. Yes, but I'll I'll, ch I'll challenge um, I'll challenge everyone to do MBTI. Uh, for example, I'll challenge you to do it today and then do it next week, and I'm pretty certain you will have different results because it's very subjective in the way uh, based on your mood, and this is this is what differentiates it between from uh, the the other tools that I've mentioned, the more robust ones, because the the the, the more robust ones they they account for that with how they they ask the questions you'll be asked the same question in uh, you will be asked about the same thing in multiple ways so that to eliminate potential bias potential um mistakes in terms of that account for attitude for example because mbti uh, with mbti for example if if you're in a bad mood if you're feeling depressed you will ha that will affect how you answer that, and that will obviously affect the results. If you're happy, you will answer. If you're in a positive mood, you will you will answer in a different way as well. That will affect the end result. The more robust tools account for that. They eliminate that 
um, th those deviations, those, those, those differences in, in how you act. Simply be, by asking uh, multiple questions about the same thing, but in different ways to, to kind of eliminate that. We do those tests, like 16 personalities, uh, at PLA school because uh, it really helps us, especially at the very beginning, um, to understand the other person and to, um, yeah, plan better our courses, you know. So I think that there is something in those tests and uh, uh, me personally i was really 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 surprised that it is so accurate and everybody says that so but my question is then since you've lived in the uk and it's totally different environment totally different society um do you think that it influenced you and your personality and it could have influenced your outcomes of the tests and do you think maybe those outcomes could be different if you were yeah doing them in different places different time yeah, a, 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 amazing question. I abs, abs, absolutely love that. And I'll answer that in a, in a second. I just want to jump back very quickly to the personality test that you've mentioned. Um, usually the objection to these tests on the individual and uh, potentially organizational level is very often the same. It, it, it might be fear-based. Uh, it might because the, the results of the test might show us something that we don't want to know or that we might discover that was difficult then to control, which, which is a classic example around that type of self-exploratory exploratory work. Now, I've also sent you here, um, and feel free to share these with with your listeners, uh, two additional uh, alternative personality tests that are a little bit more uh, robust. Uh, they're called the Big, Pers uh, Big Five Personality and uh, Hexaco personality tests. Mm, they used to be both uh, free that you were able to do them. Uh, they ask about the same thing. They give slightly different results, but they, they also ask the questions in a slightly different way. So I highly encourage that um, everyone to, uh, to, to to try those out and see what comes in because they account for the eliminate some of the, the variables that I've mentioned before. In terms of your amazing question, uh, <laughs> you know what? I, I often say that I'm I'm as British as you can be without actually being born there and uh, or having roots as in, you know, member, member of my family being uh, British. And in a way, I say that in a, in, a, in, a, in a very proud way, because that's something that I always wanted to do. So when I was living there, it was important for me to have a group of friends that were Polish. There was a, a large Polish student group that I was part of, which is great to have. But my uh, my objection, my objective has always been to integrate myself into the British culture um, as much as I can. So I always had these two sort of uh, groups. What helped me a lot is, first of all, that wasn't my first time in the UK. I've been coming to the UK for when I was at university in Poland during the summers for two or three months to earn a bit of money, but most of it practice my English. So I already was far more comfortable. And you can't you can't put a price tag on this. I was able to integrate myself because I understood. I thought I understood the society. I thought in a similar way. The language helped me. So I wasn't just able to speak the language. I was able to use the language to understand people. I understand. I understood the mechanics of not just the language, but of the society and the mental models and 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 the cultural imp imp implication and, and elements of, of the British culture. And I'm I'm I would say I'm 51% Polish and 49% British. Which one dominates depends on the circumstances. So my mentality, which is the question you've asked, is very much, very much the same. I'm proud of our characteristics. Uh, as 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 I'm of my character as a Polish person, because I think as a nation, as Polish people, we've got a lot to be proud of. But there's also a lot of things that we could improve. And my aim has always been to take the best out of both cultures, to have the work ethic, the ingenuity, and the hard working um, ethics that I said uh, of us as Polish people. 
combining that with the openness and the attitude of pretty much everything's possible if you really work hard at, it, hard at it, that the world is your oyster rather than everything is against you that the British people have. Because that's one of the main things I don't like about Polish society, Polish mentality, and we've always had that. Because of our history, everything we, always, we often feel that everything's against us, that everybody's against us, that it's, we always, we're go, always going uphill because that's the history that we've had. Uh, over the past several hundred years. But then we seem to forget that before that, we were we were an empire. We were forced to be reckoned with, not just in Europe, but uh, beyond that as well. And that's the piece of history that we don't cling on to. I think we should cling on to that piece of history, rather the one that made us disappear for 120 odd years as a nation, right? But we still had that. So I think I, I combine... I aim to combine these two things and bring the best. And that only comes from being able to live, from, from having lived abroad, uh, but being able to communicate and really understand that, that nation. And I always say everybody should live abroad for at least a couple of years uh, in a country that they can really learn and to understand and then bring back what they've learned to where they're from and in, try and integrate these two things. Get rid of the things that are clearly weighing you down and not working and be the, that kind of agent of change. And that's where, that's one of, the, one of the areas that I see the biggest opportunity for Poland. If people like myself, people who lived abroad do come back to Poland and they have this attitude, okay, I've learned this, this thing from the British, uh, American, German, Italian, French, whatever society and culture, that actually is a much better, is the opposite of what we've got in Poland. It, there it works. In Poland, it doesn't. And I try and change that. We're going to be in a very, very good place, but still maintaining our core of the, of the good things that we have. And we've, as Polish people, we genuinely do have a lot. We're, uh, we under, underestimate ourselves. We downplay uh, how good we are and uh, what, what we can achieve and what our strengths are. Yeah. Thinking about ourselves and yeah the self-confidence and stuff like this quite a tricky subject but uh, let's try and change the perspective towards british how do they see us there are many stereotypes right v very good question that so somewhat has various answers depending on which level of society do you, you look at uh, or which maybe which which class uh, you know whether we're looking working class whether we're looking more uh, white collar and business and uh, kind of different parts of society overall I can only well, of course I can only speak about my experience um, I've never had sorry I'll take that back only once did I have a situation in the 13 years that I lived there that I felt I didn't even feel that way. Sorry, uh, I, I need to retract. I had a situation where somebody was uh, saying something. I don't remember what they were, what they were starting to say. I was working in the pub. There was, I was still at university and somebody was starting to say, oh, Polish people, this, Polish people, that. And they, they was, they, he was sort of start to ha starting to have a go at me as in kind of, oh, you damn immigrant, right? You're stealing somebody's job. Uh, the, but the funny, funny thing was before... I had a chance to react. This guy was drunk and I wasn't really paying attention. He was one of the locals. They always came to the pub, you know, several times a week. Before I had the chance to say and respond to that, uh, the other locals uh, started defending me. And I said, oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Shut up. Oh, you're drunk. You this. And they, they kind of stood in my, in my defense that, that the, the, what the guy was saying was absolute rubbish. And, and that, is, that is true. I, I think we're, we're definitely perceived as people who are as amazingly hardworking, far more hardworking than, um, than British people in many, in many respects, right? Uh, the quality of our work is much better, especially from a practical point of view. The, uh, the, 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 one of the best reputations that Polish people have in, in, in the UK are Polish builders because they work twice as hard and the quality of the work is twice as good. And I think that is general, uh, generally our characteristic. So if the builders have that, 
I believe you, 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 you see that. And I saw that in other aspects, uh, in other, in other jobs, be it, uh, physical, um, uh, physical labor or working in an office. We've got, a, we've got a different mindset. We've got a different attitude because we always had to work hard for things. That's what happened to us, right? British people, uh, they were in an, an, an empire at one point and they do have sometimes still that imperialistic mindset. Uh, but in general, I think we're perceived very positively. And I, I, of course, there will be people who are saying, oh, you know, Polish people and immigrants stealing our jobs and things like that. But I think that's a minority and not necessarily people who, who fully understand what's, what's going on. They might have some experiences and then they might be the case, but uh, it's more a question of a worldview rather than a reflection of who we are. Uh, as, as Polish people and what, what we do. Uh, I, I, as I said, from my experience, I've only had positive situations. Whether I was overlooked for jobs when I was applying for jobs because they saw a foreign surname, very likely. I've never had feedback that was that because obviously I was, they couldn't give me feedback like that, right? Uh, but I could have been overlooked. I don't, I don't know. Got it. Um, but that's very general. What about... The area of business and we, us as entrepreneurs, um, suppliers and generally partners to the British businessman. I think more and more businesses are the, are the former. So they look through the principle, uh, through, the, through the lens of um, quality of work and uh, cost. So I think it's it's any businessman will will tell you that's the case. Um, then it's a question of um, how easy it is to work with a particular supplier, wherever they're from. Uh, I think we've got I think we've got a fantastic advantage because a lot of people do speak uh, very high level uh, English, and that that helps a lot. Uh, and we do have that connection. I can't, I can't speak for the other, uh, other countries, but Poland has been, and just looking at, you know, just looking at the businesses that we've got in Poland, you know, I've, I've, there's, there's a lot of shared, service, shared business services and there are a lot of companies are moving them here. Um, one of the main reasons for sure, this, they, they, let, let's not, let's not be naive. We're cheap. We used to be cheap. Um, and we're probably still cheaper than having a shared business center in, in the UK. Right and having UK labour, so let's let's not cheat ourselves. That is playing a major part. part. The same as uh, a lot of engineers. There was I don't know what it's like now because I've, I'm I'm removed from that uh, industry. Um, the a lot of engineers, uh, computer software engineers, were from Romania because they were bloody good. They were really good engineers, and they still are. Um, but they were cheaper. Therefore, that, that's where you know a lot of companies were looking for engineers. We were the same. Uh, that's that's shifting now. Um, we still perceive Poland is still perceived as Eastern Europe, which really, really bugs me. I know why we're perceived as Eastern Europe. But the last time I looked at the map and the, the, when you look at Europe, Poland could not be more smack in the middle of Europe. Central. We're not Eastern Europe. I know why we called Eastern Europe, because the Eastern Bloc, post-war nonsense. But we're Central Europe. And let's cling on to that. With Central Europe, we've got a lot to offer. Um, and rather than thinking of how people are perceiving us, let's think about, okay, what it is that we're really good at and focus on projecting that outwards. And that's going to attract the right people. And I'm talking about this now as us as, as, as a nation, because I think that's what we need to do. But I'm talking about that from a personal perspective, because that's my feeling as well. That's, right. that's how I try to operate. And that's some, something I'm going through, because it's easier to try and position yourself as, okay, what do people want? And I'll, I'll try and be that. But you can, actually, that's not sustainable. What you need to do is you need to think of who, are, who you are and, and build from there. And I think as a, as a, from a B2B perspective, that's also the same. Think about what it is that you've got to offer and, uh, and find people, find organizations to work with based on that. Beautiful, because uh, step by step, we are delving deeper into cultural codes, which is a thing at PLA school, because um, this is a thing at uh, PLA school and our courses, we organize the training, language trainings. Um, I am wondering now, then, Brits and Poles, cultural differences in communication. 
Tell me about it. Is is there a need for such context in language acquisition? Uh, absolutely, there's def there's definitely need. Um, I'll go back to what I just uh, said a, a bit in ago. Start with knowing yourself and setting up your foundation, so you really understand what your strengths are, where you are, and then start talking to other people. And once you've got that, only do what I'm what I'll say now, which is in a way a little bit the reverse. Um, but it's not about you changing you, but you changing your understanding and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. What I mean by that, very often, uh, you must have come across this yourself, people say, uh, I speak to people or I treat people how I like to be treated. Okay, which is which is a fantastic way of doing it. That's a very good start starting point. But that also is a limit. It, it's got a limit to itself, because especially if you look cross culturally, um, what's appropriate in our culture might not be appropriate in a different in another in another, in another culture. Okay, classic example, Polish people, we are very direct, we're to the point, we don't beat around the bush. That is the opposite of what British people are in many, many ways. They like a lot of small talk. They like kind of, you know, a little bit of distance. They like, don't like confrontation. So a lot of the time I, I, I came across this personally and I've, 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 it happened to me and I've seen, I've observed this. The way we communicate in a direct manner, uh, we uh, I often heard this is like, I'll say something to which to me is natural observation. I'll just share something in a, as respectful way as possible. But because I'm so direct, the response would be, how rude that can be, you know, it's not the right way. Or um, how many times I was speaking to uh, a Polish person uh, in Polish, and there was an English person listening to our conversation. And once we, I was done with talking to that person, the British person would say to me, is everything okay? Why, why were you arguing? And I was like, what? What do you mean? Well, you sounded really angry and your body language was kind of, and your facial expression was very kind of not aggressive, but angry. So, I don't know what you mean, but we're just talking about the weather. So we have this element that we talk in, in, in a different way. We've got different body language, facial expressions. Th those things really matter. And I'll come back to what I said. You need to understand the other person's context. So it's not about just communicating to others how you want to be com communicated to, but you need to understand how they like to be communicated to. So uh, using the direct, uh, directness example, if you communicate directly to a Br British person the same as you would to a Polish person, the British person will understand that and take that as you potentially being rude. So you need to be mindful of that and know that they need a little bit more distance. They need a little bit more of um, uh, small talk and things like that. They need to, you need to dress it up. You need to soften your language, right? And it works in reverse. If a British person communicates to you uh, in, a so in a soft way, in an indirect way, you'll kind of go, oh my God, just go get, get to the point. It's, you, you, you'll be frustrated, you'll be annoyed, right? So they need to adjust themselves as well. So, okay, I'm speaking to Lech. Lech likes to be, uh, he's to the point. Uh, he do doesn't like fluff too much. He loves small talk, but in occasion when, when we're talking about business things or, or feedback, he just wants, uh, he, doesn't want the, he doesn't want the feedback sandwich uh, of good, bad, good. He just wants the bad in the middle because he knows that's what, that's what important. That's how I need to communicate with him. Okay, so it works both ways. We need to have that cultural context understanding. Everything around cultural context uh, of what it is like to um, to to understand the 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 the, the culture, the society of an organization, of, of not joke, an organization by a country. Um, things like queuing, for example, in in the UK, queuing is a national sport. If it was in the Olympics, they'd fucking win gold every single time. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's polite queuing. You know what happens when you're at a supermarket um, you, and, and there's one till that's open and there's like 10 people standing in the queue. And then the second till opens, you will have the first four people stay in the queue. Then the rest move in the exact same order to the, queue, to the, to the tills that just opened. There's no fighting. Everybody's going to be polite. It's all nice and good. Compare that to the Italian way of queuing, which basically there isn't none. It's just basically whose, whose elbows are uh, stronger. 
uh, or potentially the Polish way, where I think would some be somewhere a mix. Uh, there's a level level of politeness in Poland, but it would sort of be first come first served, right? So if I moved quicker than you, then I'd be at the till first, right? And that would be acceptable. So you need to understand what behaviors, what things are normal and acceptable in each country. For example, Japan, uh, where there's a there's a very very high hierarchy uh, in in how people are spoken when people are spoken to. Okay, um, there are multiple models, uh, not necessarily who speaks first, but how a meetings run based between between um, in in different countries. I'll try and dig it up and, and send it to you maybe later. Um, I came across a graphic representing kind of discussion and decision making dynamic. Uh, in a meeting uh, based on different countries, what is like in like UK, Poland, Norway, Germany, and things like that. And there are, di- there, there are different ways of th- that it happens, okay? Depending on seniority of the person, uh, depending on um, decision-making power, obviously, but it's about who makes the decision, how it's made, who's being consulted. And it's it was a fascinating thing. I'll, I'll try and as I'll, I'll dig it up. I, I can't recall exactly how, what it was, but it, it's it's about... Uh, when decisions are made, for example, right? There, there are countries where decisions are actually not made in meetings. The meeting is there, but actually the decision is made after the meeting when people interact kind of one-on-one and then the decision is communicated, right? There are other countries where it's a consensus decision and it's made in the meeting and uh, it, everybody has to agree, right? And they'll figure out how to do that. So very much so that uh, that happens, but then there's an extra layer to that. Imagine that that group of people in that meeting in the UK, Norway, in Poland or whatever is not only dedicated, uh, dictated by how, what country they're in, but what people are, what, what countries are people from in that meeting. So it's the, decision, the, the British decision way, may, way of making decisions in the meeting, but then you've got a Polish person, a German person, and a Norwegian person, a French person who are coming from different cultures where decisions and discussions are made in a different way, right? Some are being direct, not beating around the bush. In others, it's about, let's just, let's just make a decision and move on. Others, were, other person from another country was like, no, actually, let's talk about this a little bit more. I need to understand a little bit more. We need a little bit more empathy and a little bit more discussion. Then you've got a whole cauldron and a mix of, uh, of what to do. It's equally challenging and fascinating at the same time soft skills right so how do you train them how do you get better in this area right so uh, uh, yeah how do we change our character our personality it's it's very individual obviously you know you it will be dictated your behavior will be dictated the, the culture and by the culture and the society that you're from and it's how quickly you want to adapt and whether you want to adapt at all and whether you're in the right environment that lets you lets you do that, right? Because just because I want to adapt the way I want to, I want to be the way I want to communicate in a certain organization, that doesn't mean that the organization is going to be uh, is going to allow me to do that. And this is one of the things that I I said when I was introducing myself that I help organizations realize their potential by realizing the potential of their people, the organization and the environment. Uh, if we just want to move it on to beyond the organization by life in general, the environment that you need to be conducive it needs to be supportive to that element of change um not just to allow you that change to happen but support that change in terms of showing you how to do that letting you experiment letting you try different things and fail and letting you push your comfort zone um a little bit at a time so that you're learning you communicate in a different way but it usually comes down to what the person wants to do how comfortable they feel because listen i know people that have lived in the uk for 25 years uh, not just polish people i'll use polish example um, who still barely speak English. You know why? Because they've stayed in their Polish cliques. I know people who, what I, what I call, live in Little Poland or Little Polands in the UK. Little, literally neighborhoods, sometimes streets, where there's a bunch of Polish people living next, next door and they've created this little um, uh, community of their own, which is in a way, on its own, it's great that they have that, they maintain that route. But that also doesn't that it, it builds a barrier between them and the country they actually live in that's something that i've never i never wanted and i'm glad that i managed to achieve that because i was in both uh i managed to marry the the, the two within me and be part of both communities because i know people who literally have polish tv uh they only buy things in polish shops even the basics like uh butter 
cheese and milk. They buy and eggs. They buy in a Polish shop. Things that you can get from a normal, uh, obviously, corner store equi- equivalent of Polish zapkas uh, in in the UK. They still do that, and that's why I call it Little Poland. And that's why people will find it difficult to integrate themselves uh, to what's what's going on around. Oh my God! It is so important that you mention it because um, we, we hear that story quite often. People living abroad you know leaving poland and thinking that this one thing will make them acquire new skills new language so they live in the uk and they just hope that miraculously they are gonna speak english perfectly which is not possible and we know at PLA school how to amend that even if you are not living abroad it's easy fine back to HR have you heard about the last huge fuck up of a Polish entrepreneur uh, v- vaguely because the, I've, I've been hearing uh, various situations can you remind me which which one this was is, is it about the group firing of everybody over skype oh the, the the whatsapp message um about yeah how much time somebody needs to learn or a, a new tool yeah yeah so personally i don't think we should we should judge darius because i believe we do not have enough information what's going on what was going on Okay, because uh, it could be that he is right, and the shitstorm is already there, uh, and and um, I just think that maybe, maybe we could have prevented that. He he could have prevented all that. Uh, just maybe knowing how to end things, because what we can see for sure is that it ended poorly. And my question is, are we retarded, HR-wise retarded in Poland, our society, our understanding of communicating with with the employees or whatever? Is it so bad or what? And would it mm. would it happen in the UK? I'm, I'm wondering how to how to answer this because there's 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 a couple of aspects to this. First of all, to, to answer the, la- the the last part of the question that you asked, whether this this would be this would happen in the UK, uh, it, it happens everywhere um, in every country. I, I can obviously obviously speak only about Poland and, and the UK because those are the countries, cl- cl- countries closest to me. The uh, I've got a feeling yes, yeah, it definitely happens in the UK, uh, but it doesn't happen so blatantly. Uh, it's more kind of covertly because in a more polite way. So in in the, the the thing about British culture is that they don't really like direct confrontation like this because politeness is very very important for them, uh, even though if, if it's superficial politeness. So uh, I I can't imagine this happening in in the UK in the same way, uh, in, in such a direct way, saying that and you know you're rubbish basically just 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 leave. I've got a feeling that it would have been either kind of passive aggressive or it would have been um, uh, dressed as dressed as some something else simply because um they that 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 need for politeness uh, is is greater uh, what i think about this happening in poland i i heard about this situation uh I've, and i've got one piece of context missing in this which uh, because it's easy to jump on the ha- hype of oh you know he's a horrible person or whatever um which i think he definitely should have been able to should have handled this completely differently and I, i'll suggest how it should have been handled later mm, but the piece of context that is missing for me is has this person who got the job uh misled lied about no knowing not knowing the tool that was supposed to be used Because if the person said that they maybe know that tool during the recruit- recruitment process that they put it on their CV, then they are partially at fault here that they they, they misled this 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 employer. Okay. Uh, that being said, the employer should have known about this. Should have been should have found this out during the recruitment recruitment process. So if anything, if it's led to this situation, they are to blame as well. They need to take the ownership for for this. In terms of how this was handled. 
uh, completely inappropriate. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, whether organizations should allow time for learning? Absolutely. Absolutely. In my opinion, the expect expecting somebody to know everything from day one is an unrealistic expectation. Uh, there is an element of um, uh, onboarding, of getting know to know the tools. Uh, again, the caveat to this is unless in the recruitment, the entire recruitment process from the moment, from the advert to day one, the person starting has been about, you need to know a particular set of tools. You need to be experienced in X, Y, and Z. And we expect you that from day one, you're going to be delivering because we, we, we operate in a high performance environment and we don't have time for this. And therefore, we're only going to be recruiting people who have that capacity and that, that capability to literally come in on the Monday morning, their first day, and run with everything that we give them. They've got the autonomy, they've got the self-discipline, they've got the knowledge, they've got the experience and proactiveness to run with these things. And if that's the case, then you get the person and they do that, happy days. If you do that and you and the person that starts on Monday is actually, oh, you know, they need to be told what to do, they need to be shown what to do, and they need to be led by the hand for three weeks, you've got the wrong person, for sure. There's a mismatch of who you need, what you need, and what the person is capable. They might have the talent, but it's just the aptitude, the attitude, and that is not what you need. But again... You recruited that person. It's on you, not on that person. So you either give them the time to bring them up to speed or in a polite way, just say, listen, actually, this is not going to work because we need a different skill. So we've got different needs. It's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just the, 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 the match between what we need. We need high performance, autonomy, being able to run, being proactive. And, and you, for example, you are just coming back from maternity leave or you're coming back from um, uh, burnout, right? Where you've, you've, you've been for a difficult time. So the last thing you need is to be kind of, you know, high performance again. It's like working 24 seven. No, you need a little bit more stability. You're in the wrong environment you're in the wrong match so this example here as i said how it was handled atrocious that's not how it should have been done um but the learning element of supporting people yes because not everybody will be able just to start on day one and be you know a superstar from day one it takes time that's my point because we don't really know what was uh, the kind of uh, i don't know agreement uh, between those two like maybe the employee w was just lying about her or his mm -hmm. skills, competences, and uh, the apps, the software he or she can run swiftly, right? So, um, could be, as I said, could be Darius. His decision is righteous. Maybe the... <laughs> part of performing what he's decided he had decided is unfortunate but still should we be hating that guy i don't know and for me the whole thing went too far too far uh, I, I know what you mean and leaving aside what happened here leaving aside uh how it was done uh and just talking about what you just said about you know people uh crucifying this guy uh, rightly or wrongly beside the point what happened here is a classic example of mob mentality people just jumped on the bandwagon oh he's horrible and you know let's jump in and let's crucify him right pitchforks right that's what how witch hunts many centuries happened again this is classic sheep and herd and mob mentality however the hell you want to call that um based on from what i've seen on on that text six or seven lines of text that's no no that's why i said i lack con context because there's too many unknowns in that who uh, who said what did she pretend to be somebody who she wasn't did she pretend to say uh, th that she knows something right um then did 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 the this person this employer say uh, we expect you to know this tool and to be able to deliver x y and z from from day one you know was what were the expectations climbing? probably not how that was it. the parting of ways and saying listen actually you're not the person that we're looking for i've got no problem with that 
It's like any relationship. You're in a relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a partnership, a, a romantic relationship. If it's not working, you 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 both have to have that conversation. And listen, this is this is not working, and let's see what we can do about that. Right? Um, it, but it's how it's done. It's important. So what he's done. I've I've got very little uh, concern about that. How it was done is a different matter because the fact if you realize that actually that this person is not delivering what they're expecting, even if she, you know it was transparent and she actually did say that she doesn't know the tool and she she's in the good, she's legit, he still should have handled that differently and say, listen, actually, uh, we 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 really don't have the time. We're in high season. Uh, we don't have the time to be teaching you this. I I I need to. I need a person who will be able to create that straight straight exactly so, straight away. And we we need to part ways and take responsibility again because ultimately uh, the same as you, Mateusz, you've recruited that person. <laughs> yeah. So the stick has always both ends, right? And then stupid things. Yeah, we have a tendency to do stupid things. Everybody has. So, yeah, more understanding. And as we are talking about doing stupid things, I've got a great question to you. And it, it's not from me, actually. So, um, uh, well, because during a very, very nice HR event in Wrocław, uh, a couple of months back, I asked HR specialists if they had a possibility to pose a question to an expert HR, who is a time traveler coming from 2030. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. What would it be, this question? And they tried to be creative, yeah. but you know, conversations with me tend to be specific and difficult. But this one I really, really liked the most. Now we make fun of some stuff we say in job posts, like, for example, Dynamic Crew, Fruit Mondays, and the useless shit like this. What will we laugh about in five or ten years' time? <laughs> wow, that, that is a brilliant question. I, lo I genuinely love. I never thought of asking it that 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 way. Just the, even the whole concept. I, I can't help but think that I would I would say something similar. It's about the the things because that, that's what often we do when we look back and we think, oh my god, how silly was I? And because hindsight's a beautiful thing, and I think it would be around all the things that we thought were important, but they actually turned out to be to, to not be. And I don't mean that in a dismissive way, but but there's, there's often something like that. When we look back, uh, oh, sorry, when we're, when we're in a certain situation, like a challenging situation in our life, and right, we think, oh my God, fucking hell, this is so hard. So I'm never going to get through this, right? I'm never going to be able to, 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 to get through whatever uh, challenges are ahead of me. And then two years pass, and you look back and you go, fucking hell, that was easy compared to the challenge I've got in, in front of me now. And two years later, you will do the exact same thing. And I've got a feeling this would be, for me, it would be the similar similar thing uh, with, with HR. It's all the things that we we feel is impossible, or we we feel that we, I've got a feeling it's going to be about what we what we're fo what fo what HR is focusing on. Um, I will go back to what we were talking about the how HR needs to be closest to understanding the business and such strategic element. And I think the element of them them focusing mm, on the fluffy part of HR too much to 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 be seen as a strategic partner for the business which they need to be and they should be and they've got the capability to be uh, i think that they're gonna potentially laugh at that i hope that they will uh, uh that's like oh look how, how you know we just focus on satisfaction surveys and you, you you said about you know the fruit mondays and all that stuff uh when in reality we should have been doing other things uh, hopefully they'll laugh at that rather than regret things like oh shit we shouldn't we should have done that because now we're out of a job and hr doesn't exist because that is that is a risk that hr role will evolve in such a way and if they don't catch up they will be eliminated through the fact that the business is going to go oh gosh, we don't need hr we just need we'll out outsource all recruitment and all kind of hr processes elsewhere and that is it right all the decisions are going to be made by us um and i think i mentioned that to you when we were talking at one point that i've got a feeling that the way that hr is now this this fluffy part of hr too fluffy uh, that is as, as often see is potentially a natural consequence of the fact that businesses are often so focused on metrics and money that they forget the people and i think the hr the hr fluffiness is the counterbalance to 
that consequence of, of that to a certain extent. And I've got a feeling that's one of those things that um, the lack of tangibility of what they do, looking after people, uh, challenging people, helping people realize their potential and build a business is what HR needs to do. Uh, but uh, they don't focus enough on hard feedback, constructive feedback, uh, things that challenge people um, and push people's buttons, make people people uncomfortable, but also supported at the same time in the process of change, rather than just wrapping them up in cotton and bubble wrap and saying, everything's fine. Your delicate little petal uh you're going to be good you we need that it's an important part of being supportive but then there's also a part to say listen you need to own things you need to do things you need to take action you need to make decisions no one's going to do that for you and i've got a feeling that element of in general how we are as society is missing and i think hr sometimes is a little bit too much on that kind of protect overprotective side because it's not about pushing people over the edge. It's about standing with the people on the edge and saying, you can do this, you can jump, and we'll, we'll be there with you to support you uh, along the way. But you have to do that. And you have to own your shit and you own, you own your difficulties as well. Because just patting people on the, on the shoulder and saying, you're, you're good, you're enough, is often not enough. And that is what I'm missing, actually, because um, we play the role of the third party as PLA school because we want to collaborate with the other companies right and we mostly we have this contact with HR departments and if they do not understand the strategy and the direction they're going towards um, it's problematic and it's it's very difficult actually since you know they they are not linguists methodologists they are they are not language trainers you know so they won't be able to assess the offers of the schools and their work and if what they propose can actually the beneficial for the company and not only for the employees that's a huge one the subject um and we need to slowly put an end to our conversation so i've got this one last thing i'd love to hear from you it's mistakes it's fuck ups do you have any maybe english related <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, I can't necessarily recall one in relation to English because English has been part of my life since I was seven years old because I was glued to t t the TV watching Cartoon Network all day. Um, so obviously I did, I've made mistakes, I've made typos and all sorts of things along the way. But the one thing that resonated about what you were just saying is um, I've I've been attempting to learn Italian for many years. And I've, I've struggled with it a lot. Uh, it's it's been difficult. Uh, I I understand as more as the case with many people. I understand more than I can say or that I can write. And there's a block that I I'm I'm I can't overcome. I don't know why. Um, I've blocked and uh, I've been trying different ways uh, and I can't overcome it. And I've studied at language schools in, in Italy. I've had a, a teacher, le weekly lessons and things like that. Uh, but it wasn't helped by the fact that I, I, I was finding it difficult to, to prioritize the learning because it's not just about that one lesson. It's about surrounding yourself with Italian uh, in my particular case, but watching Italian movies and things like that just kind of did, did what exactly the same thing that I did as I was a kid when I was watching Cartoon Network was just being expose the language as much as possible and overcome that and uh, just give yourself permission to fuck up to make those mistakes and embrace the fact that you're a fucking idiot because you're learning something new uh, you're really pushing yourself and embrace the fact that you, you you're you're going to make a fall out of yourself i'll give you an example um and this is a precaution by the way in terms of using um tr uh, google translate and all all these type of things you need to check the context i was in italy 
Um, and I wanted to go, go to shops and I was challenging myself, you know, to go up to a shopping assistant in a, in a supermarket and say, where can I find something? And I went up and I asked um, in Italian um, about where I can find sage, the herb. And uh, obviously, I didn't know how what sage is in Italian. So I've typed it into Google Translate and it came out as saggio. And I walk up to this uh, shopping assistant, there were two of them, and I say, where can I find Saggio? Obviously, the whole phrase was in Italian. And they looked at me strangely. I'm going, oh, fucking hell, you know, I, I screwed up. I, made, I, I said something that they didn't understand. Right? Uh, and, they, and they said, Saggio? Uh, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a look. And they could, they could not fathom what the hell I was talking about. Um, but eventually, we, we figured it out what I was looking for. It turns out, obviously, the word sage in Italian is a, uh, sorry, in, in English, sage is a herb, as the thing I was looking for. But also, it's got another meaning. Sage is a very wise person, an old person with a lot of wisdom. And sage, as in saggio in Italian, was sage. So they were wondering, why the hell am I looking for old wise, ma wise man in a supermarket? to buy, to make it even worse. The word I was looking for in Italian was uh, salvia. Uh, and that was the, that, that was, that was the problem. Uh, that I used the translator, but I didn't look at the context. I didn't look at the meaning of the word. I didn't look it up in a dictionary. So, and it, it was fun. I still remember that uh, as, as, as a little fuck up, but then it, it's a precaution. Love translators, use them as much as you can. And you, and you have to be careful of things like that. Another example, very quick one I'll give you from uh, a recent translation. Um, the, I, I often use the word arbitrary, uh, that something is arbitrary, as in has kind of multiple meanings. It kind of it depends, right? Uh, in Polish, it's arbitralne, but the meaning is completely different. So you have to be careful when things are translated directly. There might be an equivalent to what that word means in English or Polish, right? So when you use Google Translate, it, it's an, it's easy to say, oh, you know, it gives you the whole sentence. You put it in the whole sentence, gives you the whole sentence. You take it, and nine times out of ten, you will be it will be fine. It will be correct. But sometimes there there are particular expressions or words that, if translated directly, they don't make any sense whatsoever. Okay, guys, stage direction here. Mm -hmm. It seems like I managed some smart yeah. and intelligent and funny joke. But yeah. I have no idea what was that, and mm, yeah, so <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, uh, the, the thing that I'll say, when you, when you translate, don't translate individual words. Don't try, even translate individual sentences. Translate a paragraph, because then the tools are smart, and the, the, the translation tools are brilliant. They know, the con they can detect the context based on, obviously, what it is in the word, uh, the, 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 the sentence, the paragraph, and they'll give you the right thing. But you need to give it enough context. But you still have to double check it. Because you might, you can make some really funny and, and um, sometimes embarrassing mistakes, and if those are, you know, if that's that's that, that's all there is, that's fine. But you sometimes can be, you know, you can cause offence. You can you can lose a business deal as a result of that. So you need to be mindful of that, right? Uh, so use the tools. They're brilliant, but they're tools. There's something that they're not to do. They're not there to do the, your job for you. They are there to make your job easier. But it's still on you to double check. Thank you very, very much for all the wise words that <laughs> you've uttered and shared with us the insights and your experience and advice. This is very, very useful. And thank you all for your attention. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. If anyone's got any questions, wants to follow up, or most of all, disagree with anything that I said, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to, to get in touch. And then we can have we can continue having a conversation there, either in Polish or in English, whatever your preference is. It, Italian, maybe not just yet, uh, but Polish and English for sure. Lovely. All right. Cheers.